Well, welcome again, uh, lesson number six. This evening, uh, I was hoping to do the two churches, the Church of Pergamos and the Church of Thyatira, but because there's a lot of material, a lot of background material we're going to cover this evening, we're only going to go through the Church of Pergamos. And that's uh, some of the things that Jesus Christ says about this church have a lot of meaning behind them, behind the words that he says, and we'll, get, we'll see why. <coughs> Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church of, in Pergamos write, These things says he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Very important words there. Even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. The way this man died is horrific. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Again, this doctrine comes up again. And we'll see why that's important. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. See what he says? Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them. Not with the church, with those inside the church who are not Christians. Because remember, it's only until the last hundred years that the church is predominantly Christians. A hundred years ago, going to church was a normal thing. But so, not only a hundred years ago, even two, three hundred years ago, people went to church as a part of life. And there was a lot of lost people in churches. Nowadays, even Christians don't go to church. How things have changed quickly. That's right. Uh, verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, we talked about what overcoming means, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So something happened during this church period. Now, as we've said, there are three applications to each of these churches. One is a historical application. These are actual churches that existed in that time, in John's day. It, there is a doctrinal application. I believe the seven churches outline the seven periods of church history. And then there is a practical application. Who can tell me what the practical application is? I believe every church exhibits one or more of the characteristics of these seven churches. So, the Church of Pergamos represents the compromising church. We'll find out what they compromised in. And we said it begins around 313 AD. That was the year that Constantine, the emperor, at some point in Roman history, they had two emperors ruling at the same time. Sometimes they had civil war. Sometimes they had one, but in this case there were two emperors ruling, Constantine I and Licinius, and they established tolerance for Christianity in 313 AD. And we believe, now these dates are not written in stone, but these are the dates that we use to approximate the, the, the time that this church period uh, spans. And we believe it ends in 606 AD. Something happened in 606 AD. This guy Boniface was elected Pope. And a year later, this is what he says. He makes a decree and he says, The see of the blessed Peter the Apostle should be the head of all the churches. This ensured that the title of universal bishop belonged exclusively to the Bishop of Rome. And who is the Bishop of Rome? The Pope. The Pope. And he is the ex officio leader of the worldwide church. That means by virtue of holding that position, he is the leader of all the churches. Right. Thumbs down. I agree. So that's not true. So the and, and look how the compromise happened. We're going to go through the history of how it happened. Pergamus means much marriage. And it is during this time period in the church's history where Rome, pagan Rome, unites with the Christian churches. In 313, Constantine, the emperor of Rome, said he saw a fiery cross in the sky, and he said, in this sign thou shalt conquer. And he said on this fiery cross, he saw those letters that he would conquer in this sign. So Constantine took this. Now, did he see a vision? 
or did he just make it up out of expediency? Your guess is as good as mine. But he used this to say, I'm going to become a Christian now. And what he does is he calls a council and he says, I'm going to be a Christian now. I want all the Christian pastors to come and meet with me. Well, many, many did, but some didn't. And what he told them there, he says, I will become a Christian if you guys allow me to be the head over all your churches. Some said yes. Some said yes. Because he promised them things. He promised them toleration. He promised them positions in high places. He promised them they wouldn't have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. And then, money. But then what he does is he looks at the pagan priests. And he says, if you guys join us and you guys become Christians, I'll pay you. What do you think the pagan priest did? What's another god? We worship so many gods. So that's what happened. So he united the Christians and the pagans into one organization. And then they told him, well, you have to be baptized in order to be a Christian. And he says, well, let me ask you this. He says, if I get baptized, what happens to the sins I commit after I get baptized? And they had no answer for him. Because by that time, they hadn't fully developed their doctrine. And they said, okay. And he actually postponed his baptism until his death. And right before he died, he was baptized by Eusebius of Nicomedia. And when they sprinkled the water on his forehead, all his sins vanished. <laughs> Sorry, I think so. That was <laughs> Puff the magic dragon. They vanished just like that. But regardless, when he established Christianity, tolerance to Christianity, about 11 years later, he actually made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. But there's one thing he never did. He never banned the pagan rituals. And some say he lived secretly as a pagan all his life. So what caused this guy to bring in Christianity under the umbrella of the Roman Empire? They were killing so many Christians that the Romans themselves were afraid they wouldn't have anybody left over. In some cases, the, the Roman Empire, the Roman emperors and the leaders in the Roman Empire said, we got to stop this thing. We're killing too many of these people. Tens of thousands of people were put to death for their faith. And then what happens in the next couple hundred years, the hierarchy which was organized, which was organized by Constantine, developed into what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church claims the, that they were the one true church, the first church. It wasn't. They developed over the years and over the centuries. And one of the, they started passing laws. They no longer started teaching the New Testament, but they started passing laws. And one of the first laws they passed in 416 AD was that you had to have your children baptized. And if you didn't have your children baptized, then you were a heretic, and they began to persecute the people who did not baptize their children. It was compulsory child baptism. So that's the Church of Pergamos. What happened during that church age period? A lot of pastors, they gave in because of the persecution was so severe. They gave in and they united with the Roman Empire, creating the Roman Catholic Church. So that's some history there. Now, in this passage, we come across a statement that says that in Pergamos was a seat of Satan. Have you ever guys wondered what Christ meant by that when he said the seat of Satan was in Pergamos? Jesus himself said that that's where the seat of Satan is located. And once we study some history, we'll find out why. In the third century, Pergamum was the, the, the city is called Pergamus, Pergamon, Pergamum. So we're going to use these words interchangeably, depending on when we say Pergamum, we're referring to the Roman city. When we say Pergamus, we're referring to the church, what the Bible says. So uh, don't get caught around the axle over whether it's Pergamus, Pergamum, or Pergamon. Or something else. No. Um, well, they say that Pergamum was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. We, we studied the Roman province of Asia a couple of lessons ago. And what was in the Roman province of Asia? Western uh, the western half of Turkey. But what else? We're st what are we studying in the book of Red right now? All of the seven other churches were in Asia. And this city, they say, that had an acropolis rivaled out of Athens, and it had the second largest library in the known world in that day. It was a very large center of learning. 
It was also renowned for housing the altar of Zeus. Who knows who Zeus is? He was the chief of the gods of the ancient Greeks, right? Is that what you were going to say? I read your mind. I was going to say he was the king of the ancient Greek gods. King of the ancient Greek gods. Okay. And this, he was the supreme deity of ancient, ancient Greek religion. Also in Pergamum, temples of other gods, but three prominent ones were Dionysius, who was the son of Zeus. Now, the Dionysius worship was so immoral that the actual Roman Empire outlawed the worship of Dionysius. Now, I can't tell you what they did. Look it up for yourself. It's a, we got little ears here. It was, it was even the Romans themselves said what these guys are doing is immoral. Imagine that. If the Romans saw what these guys were doing and called it immoral, you can imagine how bad it was. So Asclepius was there. He was a snake god of healing. And Demeter, the goddess of grain. And Pergamum in this city was also the first city to establish emperor worship. Who knows what that is? The emperors <coughs> of the Roman Empire were worshipped as what? As gods. It actually happened in Pergamum. And they worshipped there at the, at the temple of the goddess of Athena. And refusal to worship the emperor as God resulted in what? Death. In death. And uh, that's how Antipas, who happened to be the pastor of the church of Pergamum, died. Now, they were forcing people to worship the emperor's God. Do you guys see a similarity there that will happen in the tribulation? It's exactly what's going to happen again. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as should not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So the Antichrist is going to have a replica of himself. Some people say it could be a, a robot or artificial intelligence or some kind of technologi technological marvel. But whatever it, it is, this image is going to speak and the people are going to marvel and they're going to be forced to worship it. Now, I want to give you some more background of the church of, uh, of, of Pergamus, why the city is so critical in understanding why Christ said it is a seat of Satan. Now, something else uh, occurred in Pergamus. It, Mystery Babylon religion had a foothold in Pergamum. Why is Mystery Babylon important? Because God talks about her in Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 16, Revelation chapter 17, and Revelation chapter 18. So it behooves us to find out what is this Mystery Babylon that Christ is talking about. Now, if you remember in your Bible, in Genesis chapter 10 was the first time pagan worship started after the flood. Babel, the city of Babel, who's heard of the Tower of Babel? Now, Babel and Babylon are the same city. Babel is the word given in Hebrew. Babylon is actually the Greek word for that city. So they are the same city. So when you see Babel and Babylon, we're talking about the same city, just a different name. And Nimrod was the first man to establish the kingdom in Babel. And he also established the Babylonian mystical priesthood, which taught that the religion of Semiramis, Tamas, and Nimrod. Now, this may not mean anything to you right now, but once we explain to you what this religion was, you'll understand. Nimrod was a great and mighty man before God. Now, this guy had relations with his mother and produced a son, and they called his name Tamas. And now Tamas was actually worshipped by the Israelites before they actually went to, the, to, the, uh, to Babylon. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. The prophet asks the Jews and says, Why do you weep, Why do you weep for Tamas? Now, uh, and this guy, along with his mother, Semiramis, established the worship of mother and son. Does that sound familiar? So if you look at the statue of Semiramis holding her son Tamas, you see a mother holding a child in her lap. Many of you may know exactly what I'm alluding to. Yes. I'm shaking your heads, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a mother and son worship. That's what Mystery Babylon religion was all about. And for your information, Tamas was born on December 25th. Coincidence? I don't think so. Now Semiramis, the mother of the mother of uh, Nimrod it was the only woman to have ruled the Assyrian Empire. Now, what happened to Nimrod, I'm throwing a lot of at you here. You can stop me and ask questions if you'd like. Nimrod was, tradition says, Nimrod was killed by Shem, Noah's son, who, who was so appalled at what this guy did. Now, Nimrod was Noah's great-grandson. So Shem, Noah's son, they say, actually went out with a hunting party, found this guy, 
and killed him because of what he had done, how he led the people astray in worshiping false gods. So when Tamas was born, Semiramis said that he is the reincarnation of Nimrod. And that's where reincarnation comes from. It all stems from this guy. So when the Bible says this guy was a mighty man before God, it's not a, it's not a compliment. It's not a compliment. So she was also called the Queen of Heaven. When have you heard that before? Okay, so the Mystery Babylon religion is a system of worship that spread across the world where the mother and the son together mm -hmm. are worshipped. That's Mystery Babylon religion. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, referring to Babylon has fallen. I always took that as Rome. Yes, yes. But, but Pergamus is a key, though. Keep, keep in mind, we're talking about the city of Pergamus. So now I'm giving you a background of how this Mystery Babylon religion started. It started in Babylon. And then when the Babylonians were, inv were invaded by the Persians in 539 BC, several of the Babylonians fled westward. And about a hundred years later or so, the Babylonian priests also fled. And guess where they went? You got one guess. Pergamos. Pergamos. The Babylonian priests fled to Pergamos and established Babylonian worship in Pergamos. And not only that, they set up a college and they taught the Babylonian religion. They taught the worship of the mother and son. And in 133 BC, Attalus III, the king of Pergamos, when he died because he had no living heirs, he, he willed the city to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire took that city without even ha having to fight over it. And they taught the people the mystery Babylon religion. And then that religion became so popular in Rome that a lot of people adopted the religion. Well, think about it this way. Just like you have some cults going around today preaching a false religion. The same thing happened in that day. There were people that were start starting religions and they were trying to tell people, well, my religion is the true religion. And from Pergamos spread the worship, the Babylonian mystery religion, into the rest of the Roman Empire. And it became so popular in Rome that Rome was called the New Babylon. And that's the paganism that Constantine merged with Christianity. Mystery Babylon religion, by the time Constantine had showed up, had made its way through the entire Roman Empire. So Mystery Babylon moved from Babylon to Pergamos, and then to where? Rome. To Rome. Do you guys see the connection now? Yeah. Do you see why Jesus called the Pergamos the seat of Satan? Pergamos is the connection between ancient Babylon and Roman Catholicism. It gets even more interesting. Hold on to your horses. Why is all this important? Remember what we said. What was Pergamos famous for? There was an altar in Pergamos that they were famous for. The altar of Zeus. Now, in, six, in 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes, who knows who this guy is, he was a king of Syria who captured Jerusalem and went into the temple and offered up a pig and desecrated the temple. How many of you guys have heard the story of this guy? Now, wh where did he offer this pig? He offered it on an altar to Zeus. Antiochus Epiphanes, when he offered the pig on the altar of Zeus, it's a type of of how the Antichrist is going to desecrate the temple during the tribulation. The altar of Pergamum was moved from Turkey to Germany. Now I'm jumping ahead now, almost 2,000 years ahead. The altar of Pergamum was moved from Turkey to Germany in the late 19th century. So the, the Germans actually started excavating in Turkey, Pergamos, and they found this altar of Zeus. And guess what they did? In 1871, they began moving the altar of Zeus piece by piece to Berlin. In 1871, this started. And in 1871, Germany was formed. The Kingdom of Germany was formed in 1871. Do you think all this is coincidence? In the, in the Museum of Berlin right now is the altar of Zeus. You guys see it? That is in the Berlin Museum, the altar of Zeus. And guess what happened in the 1870s in Germany? anti-Semitism began to increase in Germany. Think it's a coincidence that they have this altar in Pergamos, Mystery Babylon religion, and they bring it to Berlin, Germany, and all of a sudden anti-Semitism increases in Germany? You have a question. So this is 
picture of the Opera of Zeus. This is an actual building that you can walk in? Yeah, this is in the Berlin Museum. Now, the Berlin Museum has been closed down for five years, and they're going to make a bigger one. It's uh, one of the United Nations heritage sites. But this, this altar is in the Berlin Museum right now. You can go see it. They brought this altar piece by piece from Pergamus in Turkey. Do they still use the altar? No, they don't use it, but we'll find out who used it. Yeah. You're, you're reading my notes now. No. So, uh, I gave you the notes, right. So what happened? Why is this altar of Zeus so important? Well, in 1933, this guy comes to power in Germany. You guys know who his name is? Of course you don't. Just Adolf Hitler. And when he comes to power, he sends one of his architects, Albert Speer, to Berlin. And he asks him, I want you to go to Berlin, and I want you to look at the altar of Zeus, and I want you to make a replica for me in Nuremberg. You see how, how uncanny all this stuff is? How, what, uh, how interconnected it is? I've never heard of it before. So... So when you see Hitler giving his great speeches in Nuremberg, he is giving them on top of the replica of the altar of Zeus. And it was at Nuremberg that Hitler first mentioned his policy concerning the Jews known as the Nuremberg Laws. That gets even more, more interesting. So on the altar of Zeus, sacrifices were being performed. And one guy that was sacrificed, we're going to read it a little bit later, was Antipas. So in Germany, what happened? The Jews were actually sacrificed to Satan. Because of, I believe, because the Germans moved the altar of Zeus, and we'll find out the altar of Zeus is the altar of Satan, to Berlin, I believe the whole nation was possessed by Satan and the demons. The only way you can take people and burn them by the millions, by the thousands, is if you're demon-possessed. I'm sorry. Yeah. No human being, no matter how bad they are, will actually burn a human being. Somebody had a question. I can still understand that some of the Germans would have such hatred against the Jews, but you're finding Americans that follow the same suit. Hatred for the Jews is not natural, it's demonic. Satan hates the Jewish people because through them came Jesus Christ. So anyone who hates the Jews is demonic. I'm sorry. You can, hate, you can dislike someone, you can hate a group of people, but to hate them to the point where you become rabid over it and you want to kill them? I was working with guys in New Hampshire that one of the supervisors was happened to be Jewish and he, he, he degraded that guy, Jew boy and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. What did they do to you? That's demonic. That's demonic. Now, it gets even more interesting. The offering of Zeus, the Greeks called it, I'm going to say the word in Greek, I have there the English letters for you, holokavstos, which means whole and burnt. And that's where we get the word holocaust from. It's actually a transliteration of a Greek word. You see the connection there? The offering to Zeus was called a holocaust by the ancient Greeks. So the holocaust, the Jewish holocaust, was basically an offering to Satan by the Germans. And from 1933 to 1938, the Nuremberg rallies were held each night, each September at night. Why? Because that, during the night, was when the ancient Greeks offered their offering to Zeus at night. Coincidence? What did they offer to him? They offer animal sacrifice back in the days. That's true. Now, it gets even more interesting than this. There is a connection between Germany and Turkey. We said a little bit earlier, a few minutes ago, that the Germans took the altar of Zeus from which country? Turkey, Turkey and they brought it to Berlin. In Ezekiel chapter 38, we're going to get into that when we get into the Battle of Armageddon, there's a list given of all the countries that will come against Jerusalem. And Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 6 lists two of these countries. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Now, who's Gomer and who's Togarma? Well, I'm glad you asked. In Genesis chapter 10 verse 3, we are told... And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rephath, and Togarmah. Does Ashkenaz ring a bell to anyone? No. Ashkenazi Jews? Have you heard of Ashkenazi Jews? You know where the Ashkenazi Jews are from? Germany. Ashkenaz is the father of the Germans. And Togarmah is the father of the Turks. So the Germans and the Turks are related. So the Germans and the Turks are related. They come from the same man. They come from Gomer. 
And they're going to be two of the nations that will come up against Israel during the Battle of Marmaget. The connection is unbelievable. Unbelievable. So the Germans descend from Ashkenaz and the Turks from Togarma. Anti-Semitism will rise again when the Antichrist comes to power. Revelation chapter 13, number 7. And behind all the false gods of ancient cultures, the worship of false gods is Satan. So the worship of Zeus was actually the worship of Satan. So when Christ tells us that the seat of Satan is in Pergamos, he is basically telling us that the altar of Zeus is the altar of Satan. Interesting, interesting. It gets even more weird. Hang on to your horses. Antipas, Antipas the martyr. The Bible says, Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain where Satan dwelleth. Now, the way this guy died is horrific. Tradition tells us that Antipas, who happened to be the pastor of the church in Pergamos, refused to worship the, the emperor when he was commanded to, and guess what happened? He was put to death. But how he was put to death was horrific. He was roasted alive in what was called the brazen bull at the altar of Zeus. The brazen bull, have you guys heard of the brazen bull? No. It was a man develops these horrible ways to torture people. And this is one of those. What they did is they built a hollow life-sized life bull out of brass. And I have a picture there for you guys, how it works. So in this life-sized bull, it was completely hollow. There was a trap door on top of this bull. They would take the people, put them inside the bull, light a fire underneath the belly of this brazen bull, and slowly roast the people alive. Ouch. And to make it worse, they had pipes inside the bull, so when the person screamed, it sounded like a bull. Well, what do the cows do? What's it sound like? Mowing? Mooing? You know, the whatever noise the cows make. So when this person would scream, it would sound like the cow was making noises. That's how Antipas, he was roasted alive at the altar of Zeus. Horrible. Now I asked myself after reading, after reading this, I said, what would I have done? What would I have done if they told me, renounce Christ, or are you going to be roasted alive in that time? What would you do? Now, the Bible promises us if we, if we were to face such a, such a situation, God would give us grace that we can go through it. But you have to determine beforehand that I'm going to suffer whatever I have to suffer for my Lord's sake. We have it easy here in North America. We have it real easy. Uh, Jacob, you had a question? They locked it from the outside. <coughs> they locked it from the outside. Now, this bull. Why is this bull so important? I, I've, I've known this for a while, but I actually put some pictures on there for you. Do you see this uh, statue that I have there, the bull in Europe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a sculpture. Now, this gets even, even more weird. This is a sculpture of Europa riding the bull in front of the European Parliament building in Strasbourg. And do you know who Europa was? Europa in Greek mythology was a moral Phoenician princess who had an affair with Zeus. And Zeus carried her away on a white bull. And Zeus was in the form of a white bull. In the form of a white bull, you're right. Zeus in the form of a white bull carried her away. Here's another statue of Europa at the EU headquarters in Brussels. You see that woman on top of that bull again? The woman riding the bull. It's more of an artistic type sculpture. Not as clear as the one before in uh, Strasbourg. I want to read a verse from Revelation chapter 17 verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a skull, scarlet colored beast. Full of names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns. A beast in the Bible is both a king and a kingdom. When we, once we study the beasts in the book of Revelation, we'll find that each beast represents a kingdom and a king. Where do we get that from? The book of Daniel. It tells us a beast is both a king and a kingdom. And so there's a question. connection between Greek mythology and... The there is a connection between Greek mythology and Satan worship. So who is this bull? So based on what we've studied so far, who is Zeus. this bull? Zeus. Right. 
the bull is Zeus. <coughs> and who is Zeus, basically? Satan. 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 So this woman is going to ride, basically, the beast, which is going to be Satan during the tribulation period. Yes, Justin. I realized something. Where Zeus is the king of is the king of all Greek gods, Satan is the is the basically the king of all false doctrines. Of all false doctrine, of all false gods. So do you see when Christ says Pergamus is a seat of Satan, how all interconnected it is? I know I went through it rapidly, but that's why I gave you the notes. Read read over them. It's all interconnected. The bull mythology, the worship of false gods, the uh, Europa. <coughs> It's, it's, it's amazing how all interconnected. And the only person who is wise enough to do something evil as this is Satan. Satan has planned this thing all along. Any other questions before we get on to a few more things on the Church of Pergamos? Okay. So now the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. The Church of Pergamos was commended for being faithful despite all the opposition they faced. Remember, the city of Pergamos was rampant in paganism. They had the Babylonian mystery religion worship. They had the worship of Zeus. They had the worship of Dion Dionysus. They had the worship of Demeter. They had the worship of, of Sclepius. There was an actual temple that you, they said you go there, they give you a potion, you get into a trance, and you'd sleep on there. And that whole temple was filled with snakes. And they would crawl all over you. That's what happened at the temple of Asclepius. And they said, if a snake went over you, then you would be healed. People actually do that. They were not venomous snakes, by the way. They better make sure the snakes weren't venomous. They, were, they put non venomous snakes. And they wouldn't let you in if they thought you had a moral disease because they wanted to get the money. <laughs> it was all about money. Even back then, it was all about money. Yeah. So, despite this paganism, they were faithful to the end. But they were rebuked for two doctrines the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now we're going to look at the doctrine of Balaam. And then the doctrine of Nicolaitans. We looked at that last week, but we're going to review it uh, briefly and make some additional comments. Now who is Balaam? Balaam was a non-Israelite prophet of God. So some people say, oh, God only went to the Jews. No, God had prophets who were not Jews too in the Old Testament. Balaam was one of those prophets. He said he was a prophet of the living God, a prophet of the Lord. But King Moab hired this prophet. He knew he was a prophet. And he said, I want you to curse me, these people that have come out of Egypt. So Balak hired Balaam. And Balaam said, okay, I will only do what God tells me to do. I will do what you ask me to do. But if God tells me otherwise, I cannot do anything but what God tells me. So Balaam went and he couldn't curse the people of Israel because God did not allow him to. And he says, look, I can't do this. God won't let me curse his people. I'm sorry. But... Uh, but I can't do it. But then what happened afterwards, Balaam gave Balak the following advice. He says, do you want to destroy the Israelites? I'm going to give you the, the way you can destroy these people. If you can get them to commit fornication, both spiritual and physical. Now fornication, when you see fornication in the Bible, it's not only physical, it's also spiritual. Spiritual meaning is that you can worship the false gods, that's called fornication in the Bible too. False worship is called that. So they, they did. He got the Moabite and the Midianite women to seduce the Israelites to commit fornication, both physical and spiritual. And then God's judgment fell upon the nation of Israel. And that's what the doctrine of Balaam is. So in like manner, the false prophets crept into the church of Pergamos and seduced the Christians to sin against God. And how did they do it? Back in the day when they worshipped, they had the temple priestesses. And you know what they did at the, with the temple priestesses. We, don't, we, don't, we do not need to get in. And the Bible warns us that in the last days, the same thing is going to happen. Seducing spirits will, are going to be behind the apostasy of many Christians. And that's why it's so important as Christians that we live holy lives. <laughs> if you do not live a holy life, you open yourself up to attack by the, the enemy by the devil. God cannot protect you if you do not live a holy life. Because then the devil says and say, comes to God and says, hey, your child, your daughter is doing this and this. I'm going to attack them. And sometimes God has to let them. Because you're not protected by holy. That's why we live holy life. Not because we want to be legalists and want to tell people I'm better than you. 
I want to live a holy life because I don't want the devil to come and have his way with me. Because the Bible says, Christians are going to be taken captive by the devil at his own will. Maybe sometime we'll teach on that. But they don't even realize it. Sometimes the devil will attack you. He attacks all of us. We're, we're, nobody is exempt from this. And you do not even realize he's attacking you. And that's why you have to be in prayer. Because think about it. Can you compare with power and, and intelligence with the devil? No. No way. He's the wisest, most powerful being God ever created. The only recourse we have against him is through the power of God, through the power of spirit. The other doctrine that we uh, that they were rebuked for is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which we dealt in the previous lesson. But uh, Daniel had a question last week, and I wanted to deal with that a little bit, just to put it on paper, that there's this guy who said that Nicholas, the first deacon of, the, of Jerusalem, supposedly departed from the faith and he gathered a following and he said to them that it was okay to have to do what you will you're a christian now so it's okay you can sin you're forgiven you're a child of the king this idea of this doctrine of the nicolaitans was proposed by <clears throat> isidore of seville and he happened to be a catholic scholar now do you think he had any vested interest in the talk in attacking the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Who remembers in a nutshell what this doctrine was that we studied last week? What did they do? You're gonna pull up last week's notes, aren't you? Benjamin. Uh, hierarchy in the church. Hierarchy in the church. That means that the leadership, the, pa the pastors and the deacons are above the people. What does that sound like? Catholic Church. So this Catholic theologian, do you think he had a vested interest in attacking this doctrine? Saying, well, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans has nothing to do with people lording it, with uh, the leaders lording it over the people, but it has to do with this guy Nicholas, who happened to be the first deacon of the church, who said it's okay to indulge with one another. And he says that this guy Nicholas had a very attractive wife, and because of her beauty, he abandoned her so anyone can have his way with her. That's what he wrote. It's in his writing. He actually wrote this. Now, I, some people say that his writings are suspect. Uh, and I want to, in light of the doctrine of Balaam, which teaches that he, he basically taught the children of Israel to commit fornication. He seduced them to commit fornication. So now God would not repeat these two doctrines. They're not one and the same. They're different doctrines. The doctrines of Nicolaitans deal with the fact that the leaders of that church were lording it over to the people, and they were making the people basically, in a way, bow down to them. So you think a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit would be accused of debauchery by a guy who shows up 600 years later? It just doesn't make sense. And he's the only guy that writes about it. So every time you look at the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in the Britannica Encyclopedia, in Wikipedia, they always repeat what this guy, uh, Isidore, wrote. And then finally, we're going to deal with the promise of this church. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Who is the hidden manna? Anybody know who the hidden manna is? Somebody. What was that, Justin? I said somebody. Somebody, but who is it? <laughs> <laughs> we know it's somebody. I'll give you a hint. I'm going to read John chapter 6, verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Justin? God? God in the form of? Jesus Christ. In the form of Jesus Christ. That's right. So he who overcomes will get to eat of this manna. So what did we say about overcoming? Who is he that overcomes? That's right. Someone who is? Someone who is saved. The moment you believe in the Jesus, on the Son of Jesus, uh, on the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the moment you believe in Him, you get born again and you have overcome, because that's the only requirement needed to get to heaven. And not only that, but you will get a new name written on a white stone. So there's a lot of things you're going to get to heaven. God's going to give you a white stone, and on this stone you're going to have a new name. I'm glad I'm going to have a new name because most people can't pronounce my, my given name. Oh, Michael Stone. 
Your, yours is going to be a three-letter name, uh, Jerry, so you can spell it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What does it mean by which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it? Because God is going to give you the name to you. It means no one's going to know it except for you that receiveth it. And how are we supposed to know who's who? As soon as you know your name, you can say, hey, I'm called so-and-so. But only you know, only you will know your name. It's going to be an individual name that God will give you when you get to heaven on a white stone. Every born-again Christian will receive a white stone with a new name on it. It's personal. That means regardless of how many Christians are, God still cares about you. And that's one thing you have to know. That God, nobody's gonna, not, a, not everybody's going to have the same name. We're all going to have a different name. That tells me once you get to heaven, we're not going to recognize any of us as for what we were related to before. Your life will be your life or something like this. I don't know to what extent. I don't know to what extent. Well, if your memories can be wiped clean from your past life, how are you going to remember who you associate with? I, I, I don't know the answer to that specifically. Because when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, physically they didn't recognize him. They didn't know who he was. When they saw him, they couldn't recognize him physically. But when he started speaking to them, they recognized him. And when he showed them the scars, they recognized him. But physically, he was different. Different enough that they couldn't recognize him. Well, wouldn't that give you a recollection of the sinful life on earth if you remember who these people are? I don't think, because God says he's going to wipe away, bless you, but God says he's going to wipe away all our tears. And our sins are no, remembered no more. And that's the thing, the devil, if you dwell on your past, it's the devil that brings up your past. Oh, yeah. God will never bring up your past because the moment you ask for forgiveness and God forgives you of your sins, they're wiped clean. Right now, you say, Lord, forgive me of all my sins, and you tell them I've done this, I've done that, and you ask for forgiveness, they're gone. God says, I'll remember them no more. I did that for years. And it's the devil that beats us up with our past. Yeah. If you find yourself beating up over your past, it's spiritual attack. It I can do that for a growing. fact. It stops you from growing. It stops you from growing. It does, because I was, I didn't feel worthy. I was, I'm just as worthy as the next guy. If you forgave you, if he gave you, if he gave you, I'm no different. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you could, yeah, but you, we we all you be, you Saul. we all believe that God forgave us. But why is it that we do? I we're all guilty of that. Who's here has never thought about their past and beaten themselves up over it? I did. Nobody can raise your hand because we all do it. Yep. And sometimes that's how the devil gets to us. He brings up your past and he beats you up over your past. Then you're ineffective. That's right. God says forgetting those things which are behind. Every day, that's why every day you have to renew yourself in Christ. Every day you have to renew yourself in Christ. I'll give you one more verse and then we'll, pa we'll, we'll pause the uh, video and then we can get into more questions. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, now this is an important verse, an important promise. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are what? Passed away. Passed away. Do you see that? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In Christ, you're new. So every day, you go to Christ and you ask for forgiveness. The moment you ask for forgiveness, you don't have to dwell on it. God forgives you right away. Otherwise, he wouldn't be true to his word. So any questions or comments, uh, we'll pause the video. Bye to those in the internet land. We <laughs> said I ended abruptly last week, so we'll, we'll say goodbye to you guys. We're end this lesson right now. We'll resume next week, lesson Keep seven. Keep going. <laughs>